Our first speaker is uh, Haley Campbell uh, from Texas A&M University, USA. Uh, he will talk. Uh, she will talk about uh, problematizing the human technology relationship through techno spiritual myth presented in her Transcendences and the Machine. Floor is yours. Marhaba, or as they say, where I come from, howdy. I want to thank the presenters um, and the organizers of this conference for the opportunity to present my work today. Um, most of my work is, it looks at the intersection of new media, religion, and digital culture. And so what I'm trying to do is bring some of that previous work into conversation with film studies, especially around um, uh, films about artificial intelligence, AI. So if we look at the history of uh, films, um, since Metropolis in 1927 and uh, the, the image of a human female machine, um, the center, central character in the film, up through just the recently released Ex Machina, we see that the relationship between technology and humanity has had a fraught relationship on the screen. Um, this relationship has taken the form of different utopian, but especially dystopian narratives. And whether we look at the, you know, the, the, the the world of the Matrix, um, the Machina Child in AI, or even 1950 science fiction film like Forbidden Planet, um, what we see is that even in the diversity of films, there is uh, some basic narratives that kind of dominate the screen. And so what my attempt today is, rather than to deconstruct films in detail, is what I want to offer um, an, an overall argument and a kind of framework which we can maybe read in more detail some of these narratives. So the core argument of my paper is that AI films often focus on problematic relationships between humans and technology, focused around questions of human uniqueness and agency. And I argue that this is essentially a religious question. So when we're watching AI films, when we're watching science fiction films, there often is an underlying techno, um, uh, technological and spiritual narrative happening. And so by looking at the core um, tensions that are happening in these films, we can read these films through uh, several lenses of techno-spiritual myths that um, I'll talk about. And I argue that this is important um, in reading because many of the popular images and tropes or narrative storylines that we see in these popular AI films really are, um, especially in the last five to ten years, are putting forth a specific view of reality, a specific um, agenda, and that is the agenda of post-humanism. Um, Post-humanism um, argues that humanity is evolving toward an ideal state where we will be moving um, beyond human. Um, it's 20 years ago, this was seen as kind of something uh, mystical, something as uh, you know, it, it fantasy oriented. But as we live in a world wrapped with media, where our mobile phones are an extension of our everyday lives, where many of us are cyborgs ourselves through using technology, it's from glasses <laughs> to iWatches, that this reality is becoming more and more uh, close to home. And so a key premise of posthumanism is that biological and digital technologies allow us to become radically enhanced beings able to transcend um, the physical world and emotional limits. And posthumanism has been argued by many scholars, especially in science and technology studies, as an ideological and religious outlook. And so while I, I won't be able to unpack a lot of the assumptions related to this, I'm pointing forth that in order to understand um, popular films, we need to kind of look at the, these core myths and how they might be putting forth a spiritual reality or spiritual um, set of assumptions that people within popular culture are unintentionally buying into. So these um, three techno spiritual myths that I, I want to highlight, um, first of all, I want to say that these are not the only myths that we could read films with, but I want to say that they are very common ones and that you can, and can easily identify, especially in the films that I will be talking about. These are myths that come from the literature and philosophy of technology and history of technology. Um, and they're, work, they're myths that I've worked with in my uh, own research looking at trying to unpack digital culture and how people view digital culture, especially through tr uh, spiritual lenses, and especially the debates that religious communities have um, when they see maybe the problematic sides of the human technology relationship. <coughs> so the first myth is, um, is identified in David Noble's work, The Religion of Technology. And this is the myth of what he calls technological transcendence. So in this narrative, um, what we see is that um, the argument is made by Noble is that um, as people have studied technology, engaged with technology, one of their main motivations has been to become um, godlike that technology uh, enables humans to have the supernatural abilities um, that only the, the divine ones had. 
And so the uh, motivation for technological engagement is um, humans becoming something more than themselves or, some, or God. Um, and so we see in this um, myth, the emphasis is on the agency, the actions of the human, but the humans in a sense of trying to enter the realm of the divine or religious-like realm, and so strong spiritual narrative. The second myth is put forward by Eric Davis in his book, Technosis. And he is a kind of cyber philosopher come um, techno-pagan, um, where he's um, a part of a movement of people who've mixed paganism traditions with technology of the internet. And he argues that um, technology, especially as it's seen through the internet, is um, a form of magic. And so he would argue that when people are engaging with technology, it's because not just these supernatural abilities, but there's something innate in the technology itself. And he argues is that this, this magical nature pushes the technology toward a, 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 what would be a divinity itself. So whereas uh, myth one, we see emphasis on humanity, Myth two, we see emphasis on the technology as technology becomes godlike and becomes a new space of, of spiritual reality. Myth number three um, is unpacked in the work of William Stahl, and that is the myth of technological mysticism. And he's a historian of science really focusing on the, the evolution of computer technology. And he argues that there's um, a strong link with people in the computer industry, um, with developers in Silicon Valley, and that kind of religious impulses has really kind of pushed forward a lot of the um, technological development. And when people talk about the birth of the internet, the birth of computers, they use a lot of religious -like language. And he argues this technological mysticism frames technology practice as a form of religion itself. So here, emphasis is placed on um, the, the, the engagement with technology, so human engagement with technology, but being a spiritual expression unto itself. And so what I argue is in these three myths that can be seen not just in film works, but in other areas of digital culture, um, when they get translated into the, the, the cinema, what we see is three key tropes emerging. And these tropes become storylines, dominant narratives that kind of um, shape film, but also kind of shape the human technology relationship in distinct ways. So technological transcendence, what, what we see is a narrative that humans embrace technology for its ability and the control it offers. So humans are engaging with technology because they want to get grasp the supernatural um, that was within it. And it highlights in these kind of um, narratives the innate power struggle between technology creations and creators. So again, giving agency and, and power to humans, but seeing that there's a, an innate tension within that. Um, secondly, the technosis trope um, frames technology in a very different way. Technology is presented as something that's programmed, something in the DNA of the technology that pushes it to transcend and even replace human potential. And so these, again, we see these very dominant, very dystopic narratives. So technology is presented as something very strong, powerful, and something to be feared. And finally, the technological um, mysticism no, no, uh, a trope argues that technology um, is uh, meant to be a helpmate to humanity. Technology is meant to aid humanity in its development. Yet because of the potentials that lie within technology that transcend human um, abilities, we see that this partnership is inevitably equal. And so this kind of relationship that's maybe presented in a positive light um, gets um, problematized in different ways. So what I want to do briefly is just take, give you three snapshots of three popular films, recent AI films, um, The Machine, uh, Transcendent Her, and how these play out and what this might be tell us as we read popular AI films. So the movie um, The Machine is a British sci-fi movie uh, which uh, focuses on um, the work of scientists that have been employed by the British Ministry of Defense to create cybernetic implant implants to allow brain damaged soldiers to regain their functions. So we have a three, three uh, team of scientists uh, led by Vincent and Ava who are trying to develop AI technology to basically heal and allow these um, wounded soldiers to gain back their, um, um, their human capabilities. But we have Thomas, the head of the lab, who has other, another, another motive um, in the forefront, wanting the, that these um, to turn into a new generation of killing machines. And so within this, we see the tensions of human nature and technologies and the supernatural potential. And one of the key things that we see um, with, between the, the, as we could say, the scientists with altruistic intentions is that they're trying to um, basically teach the machines of how to be human and also to evaluate, you know, is this, this AI technology working? So we see in um, oh, one key scene where this, uh, the what's called the machine, the machine um, is going through a series of tests to see are her capabilities being able to discern right and wrong. 
Um, and uh, it's in, in the, the scenario, um, a, a clown comes in and it's uh, basically teasing her and she's scared, scared by it. Um, the clown sees her getting anxious, so he takes off his mask to show that she's human and she kills him. Um, and so Vincent the scientist, you know, kind of intervenes and says, I mean, uh, in, in this situation, um, machine, I didn't know it was a man. I didn't know the man was a clown they were saying, I'm sorry, can you fix him? No, you can't fix someone who's dead. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Don't kill anyone else. Do you understand? Do you understand, machine? And so we see in this, in this human-machine relationship, we see kind of a parental kind of role and a partnership, where obviously the scientists, because of the, the skills and the, they being the creators, have the upper hand or the, um, uh, the power relationship. But they're doing it and trying to wait to help an altruistic. But in the role of Thomas, the, um, the, the lab, uh, head of the lab, we also see how these altruistic um, things can be per perverted in many ways as he tries to get the machines to kind of, well, he tries to turn off the human side of these machines and just be able them to be subservient to him. And so what we see in this, especially in the relationships of the kind of creators and the creations, <coughs> and, the, uh, and the end of the film where the, the creations themselves rebel against the creator, a very strong, uh, especially a biblical and creation narrative. The machines rebel against the creator um, and do the corruption of human intentions. Um, and technology serves as a mirror or even a guide um, as, as humans use technology to lead to the immoral. Um, due to time, I'm going to skip transcendence, but I'm going to go to her um, to talk a little bit about that. So in, in the movie Her, what we see is um, the framing of the, the, uh, the myth of um, technological mysticism. Um, when technology is framed as a helpmate, but they evolve behind their humans. So in the movie here, we have Vincent, um, who basically buys an, a, a computer operating system that um, he attaches a female persona and voice to, and very quickly they develop a, a close relationship that becomes an um, intimate friendship and then um, as um, lovers. Um, and in this um, relationship that's played out, we see um, a, it's described as something uh, a more realistic framing because of this, uh, many people can relate to the idea of this anthropomorphizing of, of computers and technologies in contemporary life. And so the computer is presented as something to help humanity as they're supposed to grow together. But what we also see is uh, because of the abilities of the, of the computers and technology, they're always framed that as e while it's an unequal partnership that hu the technology <coughs> will eventually surpass the human. Um, here we see in the scene, um, Theodore, uh, it was just getting introduced to, hit, to Samantha, the operating system. Uh, yeah, actually, how do you work? Well, basically, I have intuition. I mean, the DNA of who I am is based on millions of personalities of all the programmers who wrote me. But what makes me is my ability to grow through my experiences. So basically, at every moment, I'm evolving just like you. Wow, that's really weird. Is that weird? You think I'm weird? Kind of. Why? Well, you seem like a person, but you have a, you're just a voice in the computer. I can understand how a limited perspective of an inner artificial mind might perceive it that way. You'll get used to it. Laughter. Was that funny? Yeah. Oh, good. I'm funny. And we see as, as Samantha grows and develops, as she seeks how to, she can serve her human um, uh, uh, partner in uh, better ways, that she also begin. we see that Vincent is framed, uh, sorry, Theodore is framed as uh, much more stoic and much less developed. Eventually, at the end of the movie, we see that, the, that um, Samantha, along with the other operating systems that are presented in the movie, um, enter the, the internet network and go, go away to develop their, their skills together in self-actualization. So while technology is wired to help and enrich human life as the key narrative, we see that because technology is ingrained with these values of progress and efficiency, it's an unequal partnership. And so there's a greater potential for spiritual development and social development of the computers, and maybe even reciprocity, than humanity. So while it's framed in a much more realistic relationship between humans and technology, we see that technology is framed as the, more, the better ideal for, um, compared to human reality. So in conclusion, what, I, what I'm trying to argue is that by looking at these scenarios, we can see um, uh, some ways that artificial intelligence films not only kind of function on some set tropes that tell us something about the human-machine uh, relationship, but they also, um, are, in many ways, are um, supporting a post-human narrative and spirituality. So we see in, in the movie, um, uh, the movie, the machine.
machine and technology offers humans supernatural abilities, but also highlights that humans have a corrupt nature. And so technology itself is framed as having the one, being the one with the moral compass, the one that actually can step in and save humanity from itself. In, tra in uh, Transcendence, which I wasn't able to talk to, um, the computer program, uh, we have a, a scientist who actually <coughs> downloads his, um, himself into a computer network when he's on the verge of, of dying, and, uh, but that, that the humanity is, uh, is lost in that process and he becomes a machine that um, seeks to take over and gain power. So te in this narrative, technology is programmed to transcend humanity. And it highlights that the post-human evolution is an inevitable um, form where humans will become less than, and they, so technology is to be resisted at, for the cost of human survival. And finally, in the movie Her, we see technology is meant as a helpmate for humanity. Humanity, There's supposed to be a partnership. But it also highlights the limits of human potential. So the post-human, in the end, is framed as the ideal, and, and so it's for, showing how the uh, humanity can be overcome by technology, we see how the post-human allows uh, for a greater spiritual development than the human condition allows. And so I argue that when we read films, that we need to kind of read them not just within a, a, a fine-tuned um, focus, but look at the larger um, uh, cultural narrative in which they form and also the larger um, religious ideology that they often seek to and unintentionally promote. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation. And our next speaker is Joseph Kikasola. Uh, he's from Baylor University, uh, USA. Uh, he'll talk about tracking the fallen apple, ineffability, religious tropes, and existential despair in the Nuri Bilge Jailas once upon a time in Anatolia. Thank you very much, and I want to extend my thanks not just to the conference organizers and all the helpers, but to, for uh, the hospitality. But the whole one of the primary reasons that I applied to this conference. I'm a film studies scholar, a uh, film theorist, and a filmmaker, and I teach film aesthetics. And one of the reasons I uh, apply, uh, applied to this conference was I was interested in knowing more about Turkish cinema. Uh, this is something I wanted to research, and so it gave me an opportunity to do that, and you all have been very gracious to, to not just be hospitable, but share your, your culture with me, and I feel like I've been given uh, a really wonderful experience, so thank you for that. And I look forward to learning from you. I am not an expert in Turkish cinema, but I'll be looking at, it, at uh, Jalen's film, Once Upon a Time in Anatolia, from an aesthetic perspective, and to a degree, a religious aesthetic, religious aesthetics perspective. The constant balance between secular constitution, Muslim majority, and an unavoidable Byzantine Christian history stands out as one of Turkey's most unique characteristics as a nation. This complexity, indeed tension, forms an uneasy foundation for Turkish director Nuri Bil Bilga Ceylan's Once Upon a Time in Anatolia, a film that serves as a site of negotiation for contemporary belief and doubt. In the end, the film can be seen as a type of existential ritual, whereby Jalan utilizes and sometimes inverts religious tropes to test their efficacy in the face of evil, horror, and hopelessness. This is part and parcel, I believe, uh, uh, of uh, what uh, Bratatan and others have called the post-secular constellation in film. And uh, there's a few points on that here. It's a diverse group of people with a lot of different sorts of beliefs that are united by a dissatisfaction with the secularist valorization of reason. A significant number of recent filmmakers seem to display a degree of frustration with the secular agnostic or atheistic approach. That is, religion can't simply be dismissed from our lives as useless remnant from the past. They, these films and filmmakers oppose a dismissive militant fundamentalist secularism. However, it's not necessarily support for institutional religion or even theism. It merely acknowledges our current indebtedness to those things and um, even amid difficulties with them. Now, deploying and engaging religious tropes is certainly not the same. 
as a sense to their foundational meanings, but it does imply a dialogue with those traditions at the very least. Jalon says, filmmaking for me is to tell the indescribable things, end quote. In this regard, he may be aligned with sometimes hopeful questioners from religious backgrounds, such as Krzysztof Wyszlowski of Poland and Abbas Kiarstami of Iran. Now, like them, his hopes are essential, but his doubts are often very, very grave. In his films, the darkness looms very large, but has not quite extinguished the light. Now, in the end, the cinematic dialogue is told in cinematic terms more than in words. It may be an expression of a particularly contemporary form of agnostic faith that is born out of the exceedingly complex religious dynamics of contemporary Turkey, which is also a globalized nation, at once Muslim, secular, post-Christian, European, Asian, and Middle Eastern. Turkey is emblematic in this way of the contemporary tension between the tribal, provincial, traditional past and the polyvalent, multicultural, globalized future. Now on the one hand, Anatolia is deeply Turkish, but that also means its scope is all of contemporary humanity. Now after a summary of the broader religious implications of the film's narrative, two re the religious dynamics of his formal choices will be explored as manifest in two areas of theological import personification of the word and the religious icon. And there's much, much more to be said in each of these areas, but I've cut a lot of them for time. One of the big areas is his use of sound. I'm afraid I won't be able to get to that today, but I'd love to talk with you about it. In short, Anatolia is a four-chapter story of how a cohort of police investigators, a prosecutor, a medical examiner, two alleged killers, all spend a dark, windy night searching for a body of a victim the location of which the alleged criminals cannot recall. During the first and longest chapter, the party stops at many sites throughout the night, fruitlessly searching, but never finding. This wandering, seemingly meaningless exercise forms the bulk of the film, with the dialogue naturally emerging from this soul-dredging event. Extended discussions of life and death and justice and sin and guilt and human need and the meaning of life regularly arise between everyday trivial small talk and petty arguments. The second and most significant chapter of the film is marked by a meal, a rest, and an unexpected late night vision at a nearby mayor's home. This is followed by chapter three, the discovery of the body, and the final chapter of the film tests all of the, all of the philosophical and theological theories put forth so far through the uh, autopsy of the body. The fact, um, and which reveals a, a truth about human nature that's more horrifying than even the hardest, most cynical investigators had imagined. And indeed, it is the depth of evil and the capacity for evil that's one of the things that drives Jalon back to religious structures, I think, as, as kind of an agonistic uh, activity. Now, it's worth noting the symmetricality of the, of the four act. Uh, structure is more suited for expression of temporal cycles, the unrelenting march or cycle of time, rather than constructive human action or dramatic character transformations. Anton Chekhov, the Russian playwright, was famous for using this dramatic structure in this way, and this applies to Jalon as well. It's a type of anti-dramatic ground out of which levels of existential meaning and feeling are constantly excavated and turned over and pulled up. So just as Albert Camus famously adopted the Sisyphean myth as a story for universal existential struggle, the seemingly pointless circle of action here forms an arena within which the battle for ultimate meaning is fought. Indeed, at the overarching level of analysis, we see a dialogue with, or perhaps an interrogation of, religious narrative structure. And in this way, we come to the quest or journey structure, which is a long time structure for many mythic and religious stories. Now this structure is darkened, however, by the horrifying goal of the journey or quest, which is to find a dead body. We see here an inversion. Do we actually want this quest to succeed? And this is one of many inversions that he will use on religious structures, the way of interrogating them. Um, now in this way he can be aligned, I think, productively with Abbas Kiarostami's The Wind Will Carry Us. This film begins with a small car, and we can hear the voices clearly. There's a sense of dislocation in that. But the car is very far away, and this winding terrain in the uh, Iranian hillside outside of Tehran. And so uh, we don't know why they're there or what they're looking for. We just know they are very, very lost. 
right? And this goes on for a long, long time. And it becomes clear that this is a metaphor for life. And uh, not knowing exactly where you're going, but you just keep moving, right? And there are many other twists and turns and surprises, etc. One of the landmarks that helps encourage them is they discover a giant tree that they were told to look for. And one of the passengers on the car quotes a poem then at that point saying, ah, near the tree is a wooded lane greener than the dreams of God. Now you'll note their goal here in this film is to seek a woman to document her for a documentary before she dies. She's very old. So they're seeking a living woman and they're fighting for life. Whereas Jalon's film has a group, a car, in the dark, in the wilderness, winding roads, etc., at nighttime looking for a dead body. And they are very, very lost, and their headlights are the only sliver of life, uh, light and life in many, many, many of the scenes in the first half of the film. A poem is also quoted, of sorts. It's a popular song, apparently. Where are we going? Inshallah, boss. As the song goes, we're riding on a sign marked for hell. Uh, as the tales told over an evening into a morning, there's a natural, hopeful telos in this journey from darkness into light. But Jalon's case, the light of truth confirms the worst of fears. They find the dead body. So this leads to kind of a circular feeling on human nature rather than a developmental one. The, uh, so that's another dimension of the way he inverts uh, the structure. Now to move to... Uh, so there's some irony in that. Then move to personification of the natural world. Um, in many religious traditions, large natural events such as weather or earthquakes are presented as reflecting supernatural will or action. On the largest scale, a stark storm at sea could be seen as divine judgment or wrath, while rain might be a blessing or the wind might be the arm or breath of God. Now, while most modern believers see natural events in less directly supernatural terms, a kernel of divine volition remains in these natural events. As with uh, the narrative structures, Jalon both draws on these traditions and sometimes problematizes them. Now, during the search, uh, the, uh, the doctor and the prosecutor have a conversation. And in short, the prosecutor tells him that in some of the cases he's seen, you need less science, you need to be less of a prosecutor or an investigator and more of an astrologer. And he tells the story of a woman who he encountered who predicted her own death to the day. And then on that day, she died. And he says, how do you possibly explain that? And on top of that, she was not the least bit superstitious. And, uh, and she was very beautiful. And he goes into descriptions of all, all uh, of this woman in great detail and how it kind of confounds his modern kind of scientific mind. Right after this discussion, a giant rush of wind blows through. And for two solid minutes, two and a half minutes, Jalon focuses on the power of the wind. And the sequence ends with the emergence of the moon behind a cloud. And so one would take this as some sort of supernatural answer to the questions being posed. But it's important to recognize that this is a polysemous answer. It is not clear what the answer is. It's not clear if it's positive or negative. It could be affirmation that the woman, that something supernatural was involved, or there was a presence there. It could also be divine judgment of sorts. But in fact, this is the kind of thing that Jalon does. Another example is the falling apple. There's a tracking of an apple, a two minute shot of an apple that falls from a tree, rolls down a hill, rolls down another hill, and then falls into a creek, and then goes down the stream a bit by bit and hits this uh, patch of rotten apples. And for a bit, it struggles to get out of the current and then ultimately comes to a rest. Now, it's after two and a half minutes of watching this, you have to interpret it metaphorically, yes? And watching it personified is important. However, um, Jalon says he deliberately edited the shot to keep it this way, because actually what happened was the apple then caught the stream again and moved on. And Jalon didn't like that. He said it was too hopeful. So he edited it such that we believe the, the apple comes right to rest. And so it shows how far he will go to uh, pursue what he believes is a type of reality, almost a religious fervor in that reality, but an inverted religious fervor. Uh, this, because of time, I'm going to just skip to icon and portraiture, which I think I'm just going to have to uh, just briefly describe outside my notes here. So I'm getting short on time. He uses icons in a number of different ways, and he's dialoguing with those traditions. The figure on the left is uh, one of the alleged killers. 
we have been given lots of reasons to sympathize with him, and he is staring uh, a couple times directly at the camera. It's a little too dark for you to see his face, but he's cut and bruised, his hair is long, he looks a bit like a Christ figure here. He, uh, there's also a suggestion about midway through the film that in fact he is um, going to go to prison uh, for his brother's sake. It may be that his dim-witted, mentally handicapped brother was the one who committed the crime, or most responsible. So that, that isn't revealed until a good hour after the film. It's also suggested he might be doing penance for a previous sin. The second image is of the, of the doctor, who is one of the main characters in the drama. And there are many characters with their back, so it's an an to the camera, it's an anti-icon. So all the things we, we religiously associate with the icon, which is presence, direct engagement, and communi communi community. And theologically, uh, the icon has also been seen in, in Eastern Christianity as a type of marker of presence, not just of God, but of saints, and the community of witnesses that encourage on the believer. Uh, there is a scene here. Well, and it's also associated turning away from the camera as repentance and lamenting the state of the world. Notice she's holding a skull, so it's an awareness of mortality. I think it's fair to say that Jaylon is communicating that he is uh, very unsettled by uh, the way things are in the world. So there's a type of trope there that he's drawing on. In the, there's a beautiful moment in the film, though, where uh, during the third chapter, or during the second chapter where the meal is served, that uh, the mayor's daughter serves tea. And she comes out of nowhere and she looks directly at the camera and she looks very much like a Georges Latour painting or, or, uh, or an icon, a religious icon. And indeed, she functions something like a spiritual being. She serves tea, which is healing. The killers break down in tears because she's treating them just like she's treating everyone else in the room. And uh, it is also at this time that they see a vision of the, the man that they have killed. Um, now, it's important to note, though, that that vision of the man who was killed is not a witness cheering on the believers, but he, in fact, starts to choke in the vision, and it's an image of judgment. So, in fact, even there, he starts to invert the imagery. So you see him dialoguing with these tropes very strongly. The last icon that we see is after he views some photographs. This is right before the, the uh, exhumation, or right before the porn, uh, uh, in the mortuary, um, he uh, looks at photographs of his own family, and these are types of icons as well, and he suddenly looks directly at the camera. I would maintain that this is kind of the post-secular, not, re not religious, not secular, but post-secular icon. One of absence, but one of desperate desire for, uh, for transcendence. The last image, and I'll just take 10 seconds on this, it, the film, this is not the way he ends the film, even though the film is very, very dark and it's ending, and, and he, his view of human nature gets worse, not better. The dis truths that are discovered are worse, not better than we would imagine. But the last image of the film, it, it, during the, while the body is exhumed and we hear it being torn apart, he uh, looks out the window and sees the man who was killed, his little boy, helping another child outside the window uh, retrieve a ball that they were playing with. And so it's an image of grace. And, um, and that's an important, important image. We see this image of the outside where the boy is and the inside where the body is being ripped apart and the autopsy and the window in between is a liminal space. The screen goes dark and we hear both the sound of children and the sounds of the autopsy at the same time for a full 30 seconds before the film is over. Nothing less than both of those realities will do for Jaylan in his new agnostic spirituality. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is interesting for us to listen about the Turkish movie from a non-Turkish academics, and it's a different aspect. Thanks for that. Uh, our next speaker is Iman Yakobi from Jandiba University, Tunisia. Uh, she will talk about organizing transitions and turning away from God in two Tunisian movies. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here this um, beautiful afternoon instead of being out um, having fun. And uh, thank you very much to all conference organizers for their uh, amazing hospitality. So, um, uh, the two movies that I'm going to speak about. So, 
So the two case studies uh, that I am going to discuss uh, today are Halfawin or Child of the Terraces, which was a movie that was um, quite famous at the time when it was released, and Golden Horseshoes. So there is uh, barely one year between the uh, release dates of the two movies. Uh, Halfawin was uh, released in 1990 by Farid Bourdir, and Golden Horseshoes were, was released in 1989. And although the two movies, I mean, uh, Golden Horseshoes was um, a, a movie that had sinister overtones, uh, speaking mainly about political oppression, Halfawin uh, was more cheerful and um, it contained a lot of comic, uh, comic scenes. It's not a comedy, but it was full of uh, comic scenes. So I'm looking particularly at the relationship between religion, uh, individual freedom, and politics in these two movies. So for several decades after Tunisia's independence, Tunisian cinema had been part of the nationalistic ambitions of the state which sought to shape the cultural scene in Tunisia and to create a cohesive narrative about collective identity. It was not until the 80s that a new wave of auteur films emerged to bring into focus the challenges faced by the contemporary individual which translated the postmodern fascination uh, with existential questions. The cinema of this decade was characterized by locality and singularity, consecrated an interest in film capable of scrutinizing its characters, um, one which would endow them with psychological density. So Golden Horseshoes by Nouri Bouzid and Halfawin by Farid Bourdir could be considered as part of this wave of auteur films that closely examine the inner struggle of alienated individuals who embark on quests or journeys to get to grips with the meaning of their existence, only to face the adversity of a complex and unfriendly world um, environment that accentuates the, sorry. So in the two movies, religion uh, it situates itself as part of the external environment. It's often in, uh, an antagonistic environment that accentuates the difficulty of the character's transition. In Golden Horseshoes and Halfawin, the quests of Nora and Yusuf, the two protagonists, resemble the notion of loose, loose blocks of food drift, drifting aimlessly without having any control over the course of their action. However, it's the, uh, their very aimlessness that fuels the essence of their being. Their disorientation, eccentricity, and the absence of landmarks around them are often symptomatic of painful trials whereby the heroes feel the urge to extrude themselves out of a given identity besieged by predefined social structures and to forge a new identity out of the crucible of their trials. So, uh, uh, in Golden Horse Shoes, it's not possible to observe the story of Yusuf Sultan without reflecting on his name and on uh, noticing the incongruity between his story and that of his namesake, Prophet Yusuf. So Prophet Yusuf is a survivor prophet and a key figure in Islamic imagination. So he is buried alive only to be reborn out of the bottom of the well and ends the cycle of defeat by succeeding his ordeal and bringing boons to his clan. So Yusuf Sultan is only a parody of a prophet. By society standards, he failed to fit within the social roles of husband and father. He has chosen a path which sets him apart as an individual in Arab culture, a French language education, imported left-wing political views, divorce, drinking. His blight, um, sorry. So his hardest realization is that uh, he suddenly, uh, after spending nine years in prison, he realizes that the position of the intellectual in his society becomes less important, less and less important or unimportant. Having spent nine years in prison, he now realizes that none of the ideologies that he had so passionately defended in the past was able to bring relief either to society or to those who embrace them. Like his leftist friends, Yusuf is now caught between a past that no longer makes sense to him and a present with which he does not have any way of connecting with. The image of the intellectual as a prophet who brings um, an enlightened message to his people is constantly undermined in Golden Horseshoes. His dilemma is amplified when his brother Abdullah, who is a self-proclaimed Islamist and who has monopolized the family's wealth while Yusuf was in prison, blames Yusuf for wasting his life by giving up on the traditions of his ancestors. In the first scene which opens in the slaughterhouse opened by Abdullah, we see the brother condemning a white racing horse to be slaughtered because it's no longer useful. 
which brings to mind the image of the intellectual who is, um, who is condemned to annihilation because his message of enlightenment is regarded as an unnecessary luxury. In Haifawin, we witness the gradual unraveling of a complex world seen through the eyes of a child trying to find his way in an adult world within a conservative society where strict separation of the sexes rule. So, Nora's, uh, so Nora is the name of the protagonist. Nora's undisturbed life feeds on the stories of other people. He is a voyeur of sorts and he never lingers too long on one story. Nora is a child of the terraces. That's why the movie is called Child of the Terraces because this is a story about a boy who uh, jumps from one rough rooftop to another and watches other people's lives, you know, snapshots of their lives. Um, uh, so he's, uh, sorry, it's a movie about a sparrow-like rooftop hopping of Halfawin's adolescent protagonist. The terraces give him latitude and freedom. It's this very detachment and his life in the margins of the stories he witnesses that are at the heart of his freedom. But his undisturbed lifestyle is soon interrupted by an individual and a social transition. About that time, Nora's puberty is altering his daily perceptions, particularly toward women. The growth into manhood and the abrupt separation from the world of women are pushing Nora's entire universe to the verges of collapse. The radical uh, physiological transformations of puberty are weighing heavy on him because the present system of values fails to be supportive or to provide him with adequate answers. This system of values where religion and society jointly collude to punish and repress, repress sorry, transgressors, transgressors and dissidents is ridden with taboos and where he offers relief to Nura. His journey is dotted with numerous adversaries who stalk him and remind him of his impending coming of age and the necessity, of course, to change his behavior accordingly. The circumcision, there is a very important event uh, in the story, which is the circumcision of the brother that happens uh, side by side with Nora's experience or, or Nora's puberty. So the celebration is like a, um, a parallel plot. So the circumcision of Nora's younger brother represents a central landmark in the movie, side by side with Nora's uh, growing up and his memories of his own circumcision. Uh, like a wound inflicted to the body of the circumcised boy, the event marks Nora's traumatic separation from the cherished world of women. So uh, uh, the, scene, the scene of Nora's humiliation in the hammam or Turkish bath, so uh, when he is caught spying on a woman, illustrates this aggressive disruption. So the hammam or the um, Nora before, uh, before his puberty, his mother used to take with her, with her to the Turkish bath. But at a certain point, the keeper of the hammams, she realized that he has grown up and she decides to, um, you know, expel him from the Turkish bath. And at some point she catches him trying to spy on women and she, uh, you know, she humi humiliates him in front of uh, other people. So I suggest that this, you know, depiction of the hammam, which is, I mean, um, uh, there are frequency, of, I mean, the, the, the scenes in the movie that depict the, 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 the Turkish bath, I suggest, uh, I suggest to read it as a sort of, um, you know, it's dark and moist and truly really resembles the image of a womb out of which a child is born. At the, I mean, su he suffers the pains um, of s separation from the mother's body. If we are to read the two protagonists' uh, quests as journeys, uh, uh, we, we need also to look at another archetype, uh, another archetype in the story, which is the archetype, <coughs> sorry, of the helper or the mentor. So if you are to read Yusuf's and Nora's stories are passages, we cannot ignore the role of the mentor, one of the most crucial milestones and stories about transitions. So in Halfawin, for example, Salih, uh, there is a character called Salih who represents the figure of the mentor. He's an unconventional character, an unmarried cobbler, <coughs> a playwright and a musician. Musician. He's a dissident character in every sense of the word, and he teaches Nora about topics that society uh, shrouds in taboos. On the other hand, <coughs> in uh, Golden Horseshoes, we encounter another father figure who I suggest is a parody of a mentor, is not really a mentor. So uh, we encounter the figure, um, uh, uh, sorry. Whereas we encounter the figure sorry, of Sayer, and Sayer in Arabic means literally the small man or the small one. So uh, whereas in Halfawin, the mentor is the catalyst for transformation who facilitates the uh, journey of the hero toward maturity, in Golden Horseshoes, we encounter the intriguing, this intriguing character, Sayer, is a man of a small size who was a soldier in French war uh, in Indochina when he was young. So he lives in an underground room beneath Yusuf's house, which he rarely leaves. He confesses to Yusuf that he has been carrying a bullet 
near his rib since the Indochina War and which can explode any moment. So this man has never uh, uh, touched a woman in his life and he never, almost never leaves his room. So he's really, uh, being a parody of a prophet, Yusuf's world should necessarily uh, also be full of fake mentors and parody of helpers. Though he too appears as a positive father figure, this man, Sayer, can be interpreted as a parody, a parody of a mentor. He represents the generation that preceded Yusuf's generation. It's a generation that is still trapped in its fetal change. So, though I agree with most critical readings that suggest that Golden Horseshoes and Halfaween are direct critiques of the figure of, uh, you know, the President Habib Bourguiba, who was the first president of uh, the Tunisian Republic, I also suggest that figures of authority overflow through their diverse symbolic representations, both political and religious. So, in the two movies, the dictatorship of the state is brought into focus through police brutality, postures, and messages that glorify the one leaders. The one leader, sorry. Um, in Halfaween, uh, the alliance between state and religion is revealed in the relationship between the father and the sheikh, an alliance that seeks to monopolize power, resources, and privileges. So, for example, the father punishes Nora for following girls in the streets, yet he allows himself to flirt with women. So, the father equally reproduces state authority through his, his unquestioned control of economic and financial resources and his exploitation of his wife's labor. Religion in Halfaween serves as a scaffold that outlines social order, but also maintains political order in place and gives it legitimacy. Together with the father, the sheikh also supervises the cohesiveness of the social fabric and the preservation of morality when he joins him in correcting his son. And the relationship between the father and the sheikh, I mean, it shows a sort of a kind of dark and clandestine, um, you know, reveals some dark and clandestine exchanges between them, when in the last scene, uh, the sheikh negotiates the price of Leila, who is the servant, with the father, which suggests that he is selling his services. Although the relationship between religion and state is not obvious in Golden Horseshoes, the last scene when Yusuf confronts his brother brings into our attention the similarity between religious and political orders. The brother accuses Yusuf of, and his likes, it means uh, leftists, uh, of ruining the country, an accusation unanimously used by autocratic regimes to justify oppression. Yusuf replies that like politics, religion does not tolerate doubts and that as an intellectual, he needs to gravi gravitate away from certainty. Abdullah has total authority over the family's inheritance and hesitates to give Yusuf his share, justifying that by the fact that Yusuf is not mature enough to be entrusted with the family's name and wealth. Both the system and religion share the patriarchal right to absolute authority and custody of bodies and morals, give themselves the right to punish the transgressors of orders. I'm going to jump um, a few scenes here, uh, some parts here. So uh, one of the examples that I wish to highlight is a corporeal punishment, especially foot whipping, which appears in the two movies. So it's a me this method reflects the degree of the strength of the pact between these two powers. So foot whipping, which figures in the two movies, the classic punishment in, um, in Muslim societies and in more than Muslim societies, I mean, and in even other societies. So by uh, laying wrong doors on their backs in a position of total helplessness and targeting a sensitive part of their bodies, this method is both humiliating and physically painful. In prison, Yusuf is tied to a stick from his forelimbs uh, and uh, he is whipped by the torturer. And the same image appears in Halfaween when the brother and the sheikh, they uh, whip the feet of, um, of Nora. So, of course, if you, did, you want to do something here, is that the, the prison of the state is a projection of the moral prison of uh, society and religion. The image of the, the child who is whipped by his father, who claims he knows what's best for him, paves the way for the image of the political prisoner who is uh, punished by the state that claims ownership of the subjects. And so here in the two movies, what we see is that instead of having citizen of the state, we have the subject of the ruler. We no, no longer speak about, uh, you know, uh, protesting against, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the incompetent ruler, but this protesting against uh, a ruler is regarded as a betrayal, which deserves um, a momentous punishment. Um, I have another section where, where I want to speak uh, about public space versus private space, but since I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to say a few words about this. So uh, public space is regarded as uh, the realm of the, uh, I, um, sorry, 
uh, interpreted as the realm of the divine. So the authority of religion and state asserts its supremacy by associating itself with the public realm. The public is the realm of God, ruler, is where he is ritually celebrated and where his loyal subjects ritually show allegiance to him. So there is so much to say about this, but it's enough here, here for me to point out the celebration of the two um, ceremonies with religious uh, uh, you know, aspects. One of them is Ashura in uh, Golden Horseshoes and uh, the circumcision of the brother in, um, in Halfawin. So the two celebrations represent some sort of rites of passage, while circumcision represents a passage into the male Muslim adulthood. Ashura stands for a number of symbolic passages that appear in different Quranic stories. So for example, uh, the deliverance of uh, Joan, sorry, Prophet Saleh from the belly of the whale and the arrival of Prophet Muhammad in the Medina, in the Medina and, uh, or also the repentance of Adam after he's expelled from, um, from heaven. So I'm uh, uh, jumping quickly to uh, the, uh, I mean, jump to the conclusion. So, uh, um, so if you are look, if you want to look at the uh, the ending of the two um, the two uh, the, the two movies. So the question asks itself: Does uh, the entrapment of the two characters is it followed by salvation? I would say that, uh, yes, more or less for the two movies. So uh, in Golden Horseshoes, Yusuf ends up by killing himself, committing suicide, and although, um, and he, first of all, he burns all his writings in a furnace, and of course the, the scene that follows after is a post-apocalyptic scenes of uh, burned papers in the street. Um, uh, uh, I suggest that uh, there is a kind of, a kind of trans spiritual transcendence in the movie, since uh, at the end, at the very end, we see um, you know, a white horse running uh, next to, on a beach, and I believe that although Nouri Bouzid is very critical of, um, of religion in the film, I think that this is the, the only moment in the movie that I can sense that there is a, some sort of reconciliation with divine, the essence of the divine. Uh, well, uh, the ending in Nura is more promising, I guess. Uh, so um, it comes with Nura's uh, sexual, uh, I mean, let's say, awakening. And at this moment, what is important about this is that Nora challenges the, the politics of the body imposed by society. So he no longer looks at the body as something, as a property. And throughout the whole movie, he's trying to, to, to peek at people secretly and to sneak, you know, uh, you know uh, to look at the body of Leila, who is the servant, secretly. But of course, he never succeeds in doing that. But at the end of the movie, Leila, you know, offers her, I mean, like offers her body, if I might uh, say that. And this is a moment that is a very, I think, important in the movie since it really uh, destabilizes the, all the politics of, uh, you know, body subjugation that regard the body as a property. Thank you very much. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you so much. Our last speaker in the sex session, uh, Kaiser Shahzad from International Islam University, Pakistan. Uh, he will talk about self-realization via self-transcendence, uh, a spiritual commentary on Kung Fu Panda. If you don't have any PowerPoint presentation, you can talk with them. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm thankful to all of you, and uh, I'm also thankful to all those uh, friends who promised to come but didn't show up. So <clears throat> I would like to uh, start my paper with uh, something I heard yesterday from one of the presenters. It is basically a saying by the great uh, mystic Mevlana Rumi, <clears throat> who says, the lamps are different, but the lights are one. But the light is one. So uh, I would like to, I would like this uh, saying to be the beginning and the end of uh, whatever I'm going to present before you here. So to go on with the paper, uh, this so-called spiritual commentary has nothing to do with the movie in question from the point of view of filmmaking. It also uh, does not make any claims regarding the complete accuracy of uh, depiction of traditional Chinese culture in this film. What this commentary does is simply to look at certain themes from this film in the light of some spiritual teachings derived from a variety of sources. It is understood that the spiritual uh, 
teachings highlighted here are capable of many other readings as well. The story of the cartoon movie Kung Fu Panda is pretty simple. Po, a flabby panda, loves Kung Fu more than anything else. However, he is stuck with the noodle bar run by his father, who is waiting for the day he would pass on to his son the secret ingredient of his secret ingredient soup. Up on the mountain top in the Jade Palace, Master Shifu has trained five famous Kung Fu masters. The ultimate ambition of these masters is to win the Dragon Scroll, which is believed to contain the recipe for limitless power, and no one has yet proved worthy of it. Legend has it that only the Dragon Warrior will get to read the scroll. One day, Master Shifu is summoned by the Grand Master Hu Gui, who tells him that according to his vision, Tai Lung, a diabolical villain, serving lifetime imprisonment for his uh, destructive arrogance, will break the prison, attack the Jade Palace and the villagers. Naturally, Shifu becomes greatly agitated and starts running here and there. The Grand Master takes him to a pool, to a pool in the palace and says, your mind is like this water, my friend. When it is agitated, it is difficult to see. But if you allow it to settle, the answer becomes clear. He gently touches the surface of agitated water, and the moment it settles, a reflection of the dragon scroll on the ceiling appears in it. So it is time to choose the dragon warrior. This pool episode uh, affords us our first opportunity to make a spiritual comment. The heart intellect symbolized here by the pool must reflect the one. However, it is attached to a body living within a world which, dis which disperses it in all directions. This dispersion makes the reflection of the one in the heart impossible. Hence, the central problem of spiritual life is making one's heart settle. This is nothing other than making room in one's soul for the Divine Presence. It is in view of the significance of this, this fact that the soul in St. John of the Cross crosses spiritual poetry repeatedly speak of its house being at rest as a necessary prerequisite for the journey to Union Mystica. Coming back to the short story, a tournament is announced in which the Grand Master is to choose the Dragon Warrior. Naturally, Po, our hero, wants to go to the Jade Palace to watch. When he reaches the top, however, the gates are closed and he cannot enter the palace. After trying many things in vain, he finally constructs a fireworks chair which pushes him skywards. As the Grand Master is about to point at one of the five masters of the dragon, uh, as a dragon warrior, Po falls from the sky right in front of Hu Gui. To the astonishment of all, even Po's own, the Grand Master declares the panda to be the dragon warrior. At this juncture, one can understand that what apparently is a hurdle, the closed door of the palace here, is in fact an opening towards a great achievement. I am always reminded here of an Urdu short story, Same Ka Bandhan, the bondage of time by the mystically minded novelist Mumtaz Mufti. This is a story of a young prostitute in a brothel who is peeping out of the window and keenly uh, watching the outside world. The senior prostitute sees this and admonishes her saying that she, uh, saying that she must understand the requirement of time. This is not the time or age for her to see. It is a time for her to be seen. Be the spectacle, not the spectator, she tells her. Poe was burning with the desire to see the show and the desire was not fulfilled. He did not know that the time had come for him to become the show himself. In spite of an outraged Master Shifu and the astonished five genuine candidates, the newly selected dragon warrior is led in style into the Jade Palace's Hall of Great Warriors. His training starts. Its hardest part is being absolutely hated by everybody and made to realize at every moment that he does not belong at the Jade Palace. At the end of the first day, Poe is standing dejected under the peach tree. 
stuffing his mouth with peaches when he is visited by the Grand Master Hu Gui. When the master learns that Po is thinking of quitting, he asks him not to be concerned too much about what was and what will be. He leaves him saying, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That is why it is called present. Now, the message contained in these lines, coming from Alice Moore's Earl, is a familiar theme in Muslim spirituality. It is so integral that it has been epitomized in the form of the dictum, the Sufi is the son of present moment. The wisdom behind this saying is easy to discern, but hard to put into practice. We possess neither past nor future, but only the present moment. Our life is woven of individual moments, and each of these moment, moments comes with a demand or requirement. Daydreaming about the moment that we have lost, or the one that we might or might not earn, is fatal. It makes us lose our sole real possession. The present moment, which is the present moment. The Sufi is someone who, instead of daydreaming, fulfills the demand of the present moment. One day, the news is brought to Shifu that Tai Lung, the tiger, has escaped the prison and is on his way to claim the dragon's crown and destroy the village. Shifu runs to tell the grandmaster, who is as calm and as serene as ever. After advising Shifu to believe in Po, grandmaster suddenly passes away and Shifu is left alone. This incident, however, transforms Shifu and he comes back to the palace kitchen where Po is dining in a light mood with the five masters. <coughs> I'm sorry. When Shifu announces that Tai Lung is coming and suddenly points at Po as the one uh, who is going to stop him, the shock is simply too much for the poor panda. He therefore runs out of the Jade Palace. Shifu follows him, trying to stop him. When Po persists in his attempt, the master asks why did he not quit in the first place, since he, since he always knew that he was unwanted. Po's answer is simply amazing. Every time you threw a brick at my head or said that I smelled, it hurt, but it could never hurt more than it did every day of my life just being me. I stayed because I thought that if anyone could change me, would make me not me, it was you, the greatest Kung Fu teacher in all of China. This turning of me into not me, called transcending oneself by Fritz Hof Schwann, is the alpha at omega of spiritual life. It is the only legitimate intention for choosing a spiritual path and a spiritual master. One does not do this in order to work miracles or arrive at some specific state or station. In real spirituality, there is no concept of arriving at. Ubusul in Arabic. It was said in the presence of a great classical Sufi master that a person so and so has arrived, to which the master quickly added, to hell. The person has arrived at hell. <coughs> The foremost prerequisite of self-transformation is the dissatisfaction with the self. So, by confessing his dissatisfaction and expressing the wish of self-transformation, the panda reveals his greatest spiritual asset. Now, as we said, a spiritual master helps one transform oneself into not-self. We encounter a paradox here when we try to understand the true nature of this self-transcendence. The paradox is that going beyond the self is at the same time realizing the self. As Shion has explained, man is totally himself only by transcending himself. In terms of this story, it is not the case that Po, an ordinary being, wanted to become the dragon warrior, but that he was a dragon warrior all along. What he needed Master Shifu for was to bring that warrior self out of his non-real self, which existed as a noodle vendor. The five masters leave the palace to try to stop Tai Lung on his way and Po is left alone with Master Shifu. The master, uh, I think I would skip this in view of the shortage of time. Um, a time comes when Po, when po realizes how, uh, how he can train this, uh, this panda to become the dragon warrior. So, um,
Anyhow, this episode gives the master the clue for the transformation of the panda and he takes him for training to the pool of sacred tears. He forbids the panda from having anything until the training is finished. Once this is done, Shifu invites panda to join him in the bowl of uh, dumplings. The panda has however to fight master, fight the master over the dumplings and the latter eats up all except one. A serious fight commences between the two and finally who succeeds in snatching the dumpling from the master who is glad that the training was successful. But lo, the panda throws the dumpling back into the master's hand saying, I am not hungry. Let us consider what has just happened here. At the, at, at the training, what the panda realized was that what he was fighting for, i.e. the dumpling, was not the ultimate end but the mean. The training self was the ultimate end. By pondering on this part of the story, we can realize a completely new, new solution to an old controversy between the mystics and the legalists concerning whether uh, the attitude one is supposed to have towards the, 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 the promise of paradise and the you know, fear of hell, but I do not have time to go into this. So let me go to something more important. Uh, okay. Okay. Now that Po has been trained and the Furious Five have returned after trying in vain to stop Dai Lang, it is time for the master to give the dragon scroll to the dragon warrior. So the scroll is taken down from the dragon's mouth. Po opens it while everybody around, around him stands anxious to see what secret will be revealed. The dragon scroll happens to be just a blank piece of cloth. With the blank scroll in his hands, the panda returns to the village. Naturally, he is very depressed, though his father is very happy to see him. Again, in order to lighten his son up, the father tells him that the secret recipe of his famous secret ingredient soup, in fact, was nothing. And says that to make something special, you need only to believe it to be special. These words came as a bolt of lightning to Poe, who opens up the dragon scroll, and this time it is not blank. Nothing to be sure is written on it, but Poe can see his own reflection in the shiny silk. So the secret to limitless power is the one who has attained the dragon scroll himself, and not something written on the scroll. So he runs back to the palace where Master Shifu is trying to hold Thailand. What has happened here illuminates another central dimension of the of spirituality. The key to success on spiritual path is possessed by no one but the spiritual seeker himself. At the end of the journey, if there is such a thing, the traveler will acquire nothing but his real true self. The dimension, this dimension was elaborated in a marvelous way by the Persian Sufi poet Fariduddin Attar in his work Conference of the Birds, Mantik Attair. The story goes something like this. The birds are worried because they have no king so they go to seek the advice of the Hupo who tells them of a legendary bird Simur living far away. They come to think that Simur can be their ruler, so the Hupo leads them in the quest for that bird. The whole flock is not able to continue the journey as many of them either die on the way, become sick or simply come back. But when only 30 birds, only 30 birds are able to make it to the dwelling of place of Simur, but when the final curtain is raised, they are astonished to find that there is nobody behind it. Eventually they understand that Seymour is not some specific bird, but it simply means C30 and Murg birds. So those 30 birds themselves that could pass through all the stages were really Seymour. So what you get at the end of your spiritual journey is only a new you. Let me uh, just conclude uh, this thing. Uh, when Po reaches back at the Jade Palace, Tai Lung is about to kill Master Shifu. However, he follows Po when he sees him holding the dragon scroll. After a brilliant fight, Po kills Tai Lung and thus proves his being dragon warrior. He then comes to the village and the Furious Five, who have always been humiliating him and asking him to go back, bow before him in reverence, calling him Master. How does Po respond to this treatment? A gentle, natural and completely spontaneous smile appears on the lips of the dragon warrior for less than one moment. 
and he says as if talking to himself master oh master shifu so when he finally when finally he is titled master by his rivals instead of becoming proud and haughty he is simply reminded of his own master uh, who was left almost dead by the tiger but the final and great spiritual lesson is yet to be learned from poe's attitude at his success at this final juncture our guide is none other than ibn arabi the great master he speaks of the pride shown by his contemporary spiritual masters towards their disciples the real master according to him is someone who when looks at his disciples dependence upon him is reminded of his own dependence upon god he realizes that everything which enables him to become a master has been given to him by god since a master is made to realize this by the disciple the disciple is as a matter of fact the master's master finally when panda brings the news of his victory to master shifu the latter receives it with perfect calmness serenity as if nothing has happened thank you very much many thanks to all speakers uh, is there any question we can take questions no